Okay, so we're here at the uh, uh, Thorpe Camp Visitor Centre, uh, just around the corner from RAF Coningsby, and we're looking at the Tornado F3 simulator. Uh, this particular sim was, uh, it was actually the Leeming simulator, and uh, it was commissioned uh, not in the early days. Uh, when we first got the Tornado F2, we didn't actually have any simulators. They, they were a little bit behind the real aeroplane. And then when they first came in, they were called Cockpit Emergencies Procedures Trainers. So they weren't full mission simulators, just a a method to be able to climb in the cockpit and do emergency drills. But the, the main mission simulators, which this was one of them, followed later, a couple of years afterwards. Um, this particular one, as I say, started life at Leeming, and, and when the F3 retired at Leeming, this was decommissioned. And sadly, the, the whole of the guts of the, the cockpit were ripped out. Um, so the, the, what was left was an empty shell. Uh, luckily, uh, Jet Art Aviation up at Selby uh, found, found the, the hulk of the cockpit and then uh, it was passed on to a chap called Simon Pulford who then completely refurbished and renovated the cockpits themselves. So both front and back cockpits have been returned to the situation that they were when the simulator was in, uh, in, in full use. And generally speaking, they, they represent fairly accurately the, the state of the aeroplane around about the mid-90s, so sort of stage one uh, configuration it was called. And, and they've been lovingly restored using various parts, both from simulators and from real aeroplanes. And Simon did a, a splendid job in doing that. What we're going to do is we can climb into the cockpit and we can take a look around and we can point out some of the things that are in there. Okay, so this is the front cockpit and the Tornado was, uh, it, it was lovingly called the, uh, the electric jet. And, and the reason for that is, for the first time, it really was. Most things were electrically driven in the aeroplane. Uh, gone were the cogs and wheels of the old analog aeroplanes. And this was a digital aeroplane for the first time. Um, in the front cockpit, obviously centered around the, uh, the, the stick in the middle here. And as you can see, all the, uh, all the controls that the pilot would need for operating the weapon system have been built into the stick. So uh, radar functions, weapon selection functions, and obviously on the back of the control column here, the stick, it, uh, the trigger itself. Um, the configuration, it changed completely in the Tornado, and it was built around this particular instrument in the center here called the head-up display. And for the first time, the pilot could, uh, could fly using information projected onto the head-up display here. And, and this was his primary attitude and flight instrument, effectively. Um, as against the old analog instruments, which sit down here on the left-hand side, which really in the Tornado F3 became the backups rather than the primary. What we have for the first time, the, the flight instruments have been shifted over to the side of the cockpit and we're now centered around a tactical display in the middle here called the electronic head-down display. And this repeated some of the equipment that we'll see in the back cockpit there, uh, but an electronic display in front of the pilot. Um, this was another tactical display here called the radar homing and warning receiver and for the first time the pilot had the controls for this as well as the navigator and, and they were down here on his console and he could see anything that was looking at the aeroplane uh, displayed on this, this little dial here on the right hand side. Um, the, the instruments to the right here are generally engine instruments so he could monitor what was going on in the engines. And then down the right hand side here, principally systems. So um, controls to operate various functions, including radios and, and various flight systems here. And down to the right, the, uh, the, the telelight panel. If there was a problem on the airplane, then the telelight panel would flash and a series of amber or red captions would come up, which would tell you you had a problem on the airplane. And, and then between the, the two of you, front to back seat, you could analyze the problem and come up with a solution from the flip cards as to how to handle the emergency. So those are the, that's the basic configuration down this side. Um, the important stuff is over on the left-hand side here. And what we have is the throttles on the left-hand uh, quadrant here. Now, unlike the Phantom, where you used to rock outboard to get afterburner, on this one, if you rock outboard, you get thrust reverse. So in, it's exactly the opposite to what it uh, operated in the Phantom, which caused a few... Uh, young tornado, tornado pilots, a few issues in the early days by getting that wrong. Um, the wing sweep lever here is on the inboard side and that is operated with a little trigger on the front. Um, fully forward is 25 wing here and, and that would be used for turning. So the best rate of turn in 25 wing. Uh, there are a number of cleared positions, 45 wing, uh, correction, yeah, 45 wing, uh, 58 wing and then fully aft 67 wing which meant the, uh, the, the wings were swept, and that gave you a high-speed configuration for supersonic flight and high speed. And then on the outboard here is the flap lever, 
and that was operated uh, um, with uh, with a big old lever on the side there. Um, so they're the group of controls for operating the aeroplane configuration, if you will. Undercarriage here, little uh, uh, wheel-shaped lever on the left-hand side, up and down, obviously. And then farther back, generally speaking, the farther back you got, the less important the controls were. Um, but one important thing was the pilot's hand controller down here, and he could operate some of the missile functions using various knobs and switches on that controller. And operated, that operated through the head-up display here. So in, in principle, that is the uh, arrangement for the cockpit. But I'd, I'd stress again that really this was the most important bit for the first time. The ability to have all the instruments projected, all your flight parameters projected onto that display in the centre there. And the pilot could fly the aeroplane basically head out without having to come worry about all this stuff in the cockpit itself. Okay, here we are in the back cockpit, and uh, uh, again, very electrically driven. Um, the navigator operated around the two main tactical displays here, called the TV tabs. So, by convention, we normally operated the radar on the left hand of the two TV displays, and the, uh, the tactical plan display on the right. And the various modes could be selected using these keypads along the bottom. So, by pressing a particular button, you would select the display onto that, uh, uh, that TV screen. And then a series of soft keys came up along the bottom here, and they could be sub-selected, sub-menus, by these buttons here. So, all the, all the tactical information up there. Um, coming down, we had a series of, of controls here. Starting at the left, the radar control panel, which brought all the, uh, gave you all the radar functions on a, on a panel. Now this was a throwback to the Tornado F2 days in that all the functions were operated from this panel here. But as the weapon system matured, then a lot of those functions were moved up onto the hand controller here. And as you can see, it has 13 buttons here that you can play with to your heart's content. And, and each of these had a particular function. So for example, uh, that one there operated the scanner up and down. This one uh, interrogated a, a hostile track coming in. So each of these had a separate function, um, and you could operate between the two TVs by this little trigger on the back. And squeeze it, locked the target to the right, uh, the radar to the target. So a lot of these functions were moved onto here in the later models. In the centre here, this was a real change to the way the Tornado F3 operated, and this was the data link control panel. And for the first time, effectively, the, uh, the Tornado was able to join what was called Link 16. And the nearest analogy is uh, the internet in the sky. Any aeroplane up there that had tactical data, such as the E3, would put information onto this internet, and then the Tornado could add its own information there, and all the information was compared and, and fed into the tactical uh, air picture, which could come up on this TV screen. So the, the F3 crew in the latter years had superb situation awareness by using this data link control here. Um, the rest of the stuff in the back here is principally um, uh, interrogation type equipment. What we have is the IFF system, identification friend or foe, was at the front right here and the navigator operated that unlike earlier aeroplanes where it was in the front cockpit. So the navigator told the ground station you were an F3 and, and set the codes onto here. This was an interrogator, so you could interrogate somebody else um, which was squawking an IFF code by putting the codes on there and pressing one of these buttons on the hand controller. That would then come up on the tactical display and tell you whether he was friendly or not friendly. It never told you he was hostile, but not friendly. So that was the IFF interrogator. Um, down here we've got basically the navigation equipment. We've got the inertial navigation system, twin INs, and this provided the information for the head-up display in the front, attitude information, as well as navigational data that fed into the main computer and then onto the tactical displays. And that was operated by a series of, uh, of, of computer controls down here. On the right here, principally the radios, um, the VHF, UHF radio, and the high frequency radio, which was only in the back, which is this one here. Over to the other side, and these are principally weapons displays. Now here we have the, mis uh, the missile monitoring system. There was one in the front, there was one in the back, so either crew member could actually operate the weapons from, from that control. Only the pilot fired the weapons, but the navigator could set them up and, and operate them. Down the left-hand side here, 
Um, this one here was called the radar homing and warning receiver. There was one in the front, there's one in the back, and that fed up onto a display up here. And again, if somebody illuminated you with a hostile radar, you would get an indication on that particular display there that somebody was looking at you. This one here is called the towed radar decoy panel. We had an active radar jammer that we towed behind the airplane, and this control panel here operated that decoy uh, at the back of the airplane. Missing here, this only a blank panel, but that would have been the chaff and flare dispenser pa uh, panel here, and that would have let you uh, uh, de deploy infrared decoys or chaff into the airflow to confuse incoming missiles. And that would have been mounted there, but it's not fitted in the simulator. Final panel here is the actual radar control panel. This was the on-off switch, but it had two little selectors here, and you could select the radar channel or the CW illumination channel that would control the sky flash missiles on this panel here, and you had full control over the frequencies that were, that were being pushed out on the radar. The remaining things here, obviously backup flight instruments here on the right, a group of four. Most of that information was actually fed up onto the tactical displays, so you, uh, you didn't really have to look in at those, it was all up here for you. Lots of nice little goodies in the back of the F3, unlike earlier airplanes. We had a gear indicator down here, so we could uh, make sure on finals that the gear was actually uh, extended. Always a good double check if the pilot, in case the pilot forgot. We had angle of attack up here on the uh, top console, and we had a fuel gauge as well up on the top console. So again, the crew cooperation side of two men always monitoring what was going on and, and being able to cross-check and make sure fuel usage was correct and all the rest of it. And that principally is the back cockpit of the F3. Big, big uh, change over the Phantom, uh, uh, which was its predecessor. Um, much more ergonomically friendly, uh, much better designed, a much better view from the cockpit, both forwards and aft, and, and, and generally a huge step forward. Okay, this is the, uh, one of the training aids that we've, uh, we've moved down to the museum here at Thorpe Camp. And this would have started off life at the, uh, the Coningsby Simulator. And it was for brand new crews converting onto the airplane to understand the intricacies of the, the wing sweep system and, the, and more importantly the CSAS, the fly-by-wire system. When we fire it up, you'll see it will go into a fault mode and the wings will move around and flap around in an appealing fashion. Um, but then it will enter the, one of the, uh, the, the, the fault modes. As if you had a fault on the airplane, you'd see what the pilot would have seen in the front cockpit, um, various um, uh, error codes on the, on the CSAS itself. That was the master caution, so we'll tell it that we know. And then basically by going through the checklist, um, identifying what the problem was by looking at the, uh, the reds and yellows that had come up on the telelight panel that we saw in the cockpit there, you could actually uh, diagnose the actual fault. Now what we'll do is we'll, we'll just reset that. And you see by taking that off, it's taken away all the faults. Um, the spills, which was the spin prevention and incidence limiting system is here. And that we will reset. And you see once it's reset, the caption goes out. So this would be the sort of aid that would be used for crews when they were first learning and getting to grips with the, uh, the fly-by-wire and the wing, wing sweep system. And they would learn their emergency drills and take it from there. Okay, this is the keyboard display trainer. And, and these came into service uh, when the Tornado F2 first arrived at RAF Coningsby back in 1985-86. Um, and this allowed us to understand the button, the button pressing. Um, how to operate the computer system, and basically how to enter data into the, uh, into the main computer. What we have are various elements of the weapon system replicated. We've got the, some of the pilot and the navigator functions on this, uh, this, this sort of binnacle here. This would have been the radar homing and warning receiver, which sadly on this is not working at the moment. And then we have here the, uh, uh, the navigator's missile monitoring system, the pilot's MMS, and then the inertial navigation system, which was in the back cockpit there. And we could go through the various switchery drills and understand how to fire them up, how to work them, and how to operate them. What we have here then is, is uh, this one at the moment is set up uh, as I would have looked at the plan display in the back seat of the F3. So this is the screen we would have had on the right hand, uh, the right hand of the two TV tabs. And what you see here is a series of nav lines that have been drawn in to represent the coastline. Uh, this would have been the helicopter corridor off the Norfolk coast. The North Norfolk coastline here and then these little um, elements on here are showing tactical information such as air force bases, 
missile engagement zones, which in this case are the, um, the, the weapons ranges on the east coast. And then down below we have a series of, of uh, buttons which were operated on these buttons here, as I said, in the cockpit. What we can do, though, is that's the plan display. By pressing that one, we could bring up the radar onto the same TV tab or the other TV tab so we could operate two in parallel. And what you see here is the scanner in the nose is actually uh, scanning left and right. Uh, you see all the information I had in the back cockpit to tell me what the radar was doing and where it was looking. So this was all uh, um, displayed on the, on the, uh, the radar uh, screen here. And in the cockpit, you remember on that navigator hand controller, I could select various modes using that or using the radar data panel that I had on the left, by my left hand knee. So that was my, uh, my tactical displays. By selecting nav down here, that was my navigation display. You can see a totally different display. I'm now seeing a track of a, a nav route that I would have programmed into the main computer, wind information, uh, heading information, and various other navigation functions, so I could navigate to a point in space using this navigation function here. By rotating this in, in training mode, what we can do is we could bring up, for example, what the pilot would be seeing through his head-up display. And by moving it around to that position, we now have the pilot's controls, which were on the bottom of the head-up display there, and this would be what he would be looking at through the display in the, in the center, through that collimator lens that we were looking at in the cockpit. And the final one here is the electronic head down display. And this is what the pilot would have been looking at. And uh, actually, um, he would see what I was looking at in the back cockpit, but he could select between DU1 and DU2, display unit one, display unit two. So he could look at either of the two TV tabs that I was looking at in the back by flicking that button there. And that was the, uh, the, the screen that we saw in the front cockpit in the centre between your legs there. So those, this allowed us to get to grips with all these various tactical displays and, and the method of programming them and, uh, and, and working them in the aeroplane. The final bit that we'll look at here is the missile monitoring system. Now, I had one in the back cockpit. We also had one in the front. And you can see here, this is how it would fire up when you first climbed into the aeroplane. So it's gone into its test, test mode, and by pressing that button, it would run it through what's called a built-in test. Uh, it does a few checks on itself, make sure it's, uh, it's working okay. It had two channels, so these are the A channel and the B channel, and what it's doing is it's checking out those functions, and once it had gone through that bit, it would then tell you whether it was working or not. By selecting RAM, that would be the sky flash, we're now seeing M came up, then P is pending, and tuned. So what we have here, we've got uh, four sky flash on the aeroplane, tuned, tuned, available. So that one there is the one that you've selected, and this one's tuned as well. So four missiles ready to go and ready to fire. And these tell you the various modes that you can select to operate that missile in. Although I'm pressing these hard buttons, the pilot in the front cockpit would do that on his stick. So HOTAS, hands on throttle and stick, rather than pressing these hard buttons on the panel. I've now gone into sidewinder mode, and what we have here, four sidewinders on the aeroplane. One is nominated, and three others are ready to fire, but cooled, but not nominated. It's in boresight mode, and not, no scan. So those sidewinders are locked to the boresight of the aeroplane. The final one is the gun. So what we have here is the gun selection. So we have 170 rounds in the gun. It's in fast mode, but it's failed. It's telling us that all is not well, and that's because it failed its bit test down here, and we can tell by that there. There was a success mode, which you could, by selecting success, you could then get back into a, 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 a fail-safe mode so that you could fire the weapons. And that is the, uh, the keyboard display trainer. So the way that we would start off on the OCU course, understanding the weapon system and how to operate it. It's open during the summer, but closed for winter now. But having said that, we, uh, we're very happy to have parties come to, uh, to see the simulator, uh, to fly it, and uh, enjoy using a tornado in the virtual world. OK, what we're doing in the, in the F3 simulator, which is fairly leading-edge technology, is we've incorporated a virtual reality system into it. At the moment, sadly, we haven't been able to use the real controls, so we've had to install um, just simple computer sort of hardware, um, a, a, a stick here 
and then throttles on the left hand side here, plumbed in through UA USBs uh, so that we can actually interact with the simulation. Now, this is the virtual reality headset here, uh, which I'll be popping on uh, shortly. But this allows you to look at the, the, the world, the virtual world, um, as if you were sitting in a tornado. So, the way that uh, reacts with, with the cockpit here is we've installed sensors here into the cockpit and those check the head position of the virtual reality headset. And then when you uh, put the control inputs in, you will see the reaction from, from the, uh, the view in the, in the headset itself. So when I pop the headset on, I am now sitting in a tornado cockpit looking at a virtual cockpit and immersed in the virtual world. So I'm sitting at the end of the runway at Coningsby, uh, Skegness right ahead of me about 20 miles and ready to take off using these uh, stick and throttles. Okay, so it's a little bit difficult to describe because obviously I'm looking at the world through the headset and I'm seeing the, the virtual world around me as I move my head. If you can see on the monitor there that I can actually look around, including looking over my shoulders at the, uh, at the wings. If I look backwards and I operate the services, then the wings will move forward. And you can see the virtual wings coming forward to 25 and the virtual flaps coming down. Now I'll need those for takeoff. So as I advance the, uh, the throttles here, the simulator starts to move. I'm looking left and right. And now I'm looking at my virtual gauges in the cockpit here. The speed's coming on. We've got 100 knots, so rolling down the runway. At about 140 knots, the airplane would unstick. And at that point, I would bring the gear up. So the gear's now traveling. And after takeoff with speed established, I would be bringing the flaps up. So I'll do that. And as I look down, I can see the flap lever moving. But looking over my shoulder, I'm still in 25 wing with just one notch of flap. There we go, the flap's coming up. So I'm climbing out at the moment, looking through my virtual goggles, and I'm seeing the Lincolnshire countryside around me. There's the wash down to the right there, uh, Skegness ahead of me, and Horncastle up to the left. So as we turn, we'll descend back down to low level. I'm looking at my speed, and I'm doing 450 knots. And these... Uh, these gauges are all replicated as they would be in the real aeroplane. So we're descending down to low level, passing a thousand feet, and we can see the, uh, the virtual countryside around us. And this is exactly as it would be flying a tornado over Lincolnshire back in the, uh, at the height of the Cold War. <laughs>